Lee and Brennan had them trained to the minute. We had a lot better horses there, but none as well handicapped as Yellow Sand. His form was very poor. He'd run nine times, never finished better than eighth. In failure with horse racing, you, you go down in the handicap. The idea of handicap is to give horses different weights as to equalize their chance. In order to get the participants to have exactly the same chance in a race, you equalize their abilities by weight rather than by distance. With Yellow Sam carrying less weight than the other horses, and trained particularly for a race that suited him, he had a better chance than the bookies could ever know. Barney's next job was to pick a jockey perfect for the race. It's just like a lot of people in Ireland, brought up on a farm where obviously you got your cows and your sheep and pigs and horses. Once you're bitten by the bug, you want to be with horses. He was one of the best around at that time. Very, very good amateur. He won the champion novice at Cheltenham. It's very hard to get jockeys that keep their mouth closed. Most of them can't help themselves. And you know, the bookmakers are only looking for one lead, just one lead, and the game is over. Yellow Sam's form was terrible. He ran maybe 20 times in the two years, and he never got near the frame. It looked like a, a very, very moderate horse. And I'm thinking, well, this horse wouldn't win a duck race. He needed ideal conditions. A bad race, fast ground, but he was a very good jumper. So I said, right, we'll pick out a race, leave the rest to me. So I closed myself off from everybody and plotted it. I started off with my map of Ireland. I'd take a town and I'd say, who do I know in this town? I knew more about the people in Ireland than probably the police knew. I just sat in my room, put marks, on all the towns and cities. To go all the way in. Cork, Waterford, Limerick, who do I know there? I had to study the form and look at the races. It took me about six weeks, day and night. I had my pulse on everything. Because then I had to go and see them and see where the betting shops were. If Barney had a horse running, bookmakers actually wouldn't take a bet from him. What he needed was people supposedly not connected with him to place bets for him in the betting shops. So I knew if I could get people who I could trust, I was in business. He managed to recruit, directly or indirectly, 300 people all over Ireland. And we had anchor men, the main drivers, maybe 10 or 12 of them. We just said to these people, look, we're going to pull off something. Get yourself ready. The vast majority of bets 50 years ago were struck on SP, starting price, which is the price at the off that's taken from the race course. They're up. And they first to show in front towards the stand side as marvelous tactics. Well, the price was determined by the bootmakers on track. Whatever the price was at the, uh, at the off, that price was the price that was related to the betting shops, and that's the price they would pay out on. And the main thing was to keep the starting price up. You know, that was where the bonus ball was. If you could get a horse that represents two to one, if you could get him at 20 to one, that's a big achievement. 
you have to get the value. If you don't get the value, you'll sink. And the ideal race course was Bellustown. Bellustown, we say, is it's situated in County Meath. It's probably one of the highest points in County Meath. They say that the High Kings of Ireland, who were based in Tara, came to Bellustown to race their horses. I picked out Bellustown because I was often at Bellustown race courses and I knew the only connection was a phone outside the track. For the coup to work, it was crucial that the bookies at the racetrack did not find out that Barney's people around the country were suddenly and inexplicably placing bets on this unfancied horse. If they could get through on the phone, the bookmakers in Cork and Limerick and Waterford, the price would keep tumbling down. The most important was the telephone. If you blocked the telephone, you were in business. The coup was planned on the basis that the money would not get back to the racecourse to affect the starting price. I never hated bookmakers, you know what I mean? Some of my best friends were bookmakers. Sean Gray, the greatest bookmaker that I have seen in my career. He was a stumbling block. I thought if he got wind of it, well, there'd be trouble. Probably owed him a few quid too, you know what I mean? So I said, I'm not going that well. I'm going to do something in about 10 days' time. And I want you not to interfere. And he said, listen, if you do any of my bed shops, I'll hang you. I said, look, none of your bed shops will be done. And that was it. I owed the bookmakers about 12,000. So I came up with this plan. Get a large amount of money on a horse, but stop the price coming down. The plan was to hit 300 betting shops in the few minutes before the race was off. You've got to have the right horse and, and you've got to get the betting rights. But that was what was so difficult about it, getting both things right. For every coup that comes up, 50 fail. There's a huge failure rate. He scraped together the 15,000 to back Yellow Sam. It was his last few shillings, and not many of us would do that, would they? I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> I don't think I could ever recover it. You know, if the horse got beat, that would have been the end. up as usual, and drove towards the race course. I'm not really a nervous creature. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I'd give it my best shot. That's it. Town was the most primitive place you could think of. There was a stand which was just a few steps and a kind of hay shed. It was windswept and you were completely cut off from the rest of the world. My late father, who worked as a butcher in Drogheda, used to bring me on the Wednesday. So people game came to Bellustown, not so much for the racing, but so much for, you know, meeting people and it's a very, very social place to come. The bookmaking was designed that it could set up in a field. All we had was a pole, you tied it up to a rail, a bag, and what we called a slate. You chalked up the prices and you howled and you gave a ticket. phone box on the way, I think it was an iceberg. 
and I may, had to make a couple of phone calls to uh, sort of say it's on. You're here, and I have to. On the morning of the race, what they did was they sent a band of people all over the country with these envelopes. They didn't know what horse they were backing. I'm a great believer in that if you put someone up to ride your horse, you have to have faith in them. Michael Furlong was somebody who you'd have a lot of faith in, a great horseman. Right with the track. So you're there maybe an hour before your race time. You don't want people stressing themselves, and you don't want to be stressed yourself by arriving at the last minute. Green, change into your colours. I had a betting shop in Parnell Street at the time and I was walking on track. In that particular race, we would have been following Sean Graham. Sean Graham had a prominent pitch in the ring in Bellustown and we had lesser pitches, so it was fully the leader. That's the way it worked in the old days. They followed the strong boot breaker. The people with a strong opinion priced their board, then we followed. So I've got to go the same price as Sean Graham, and then the guy next to me is going to have to do the same thing, and it works right down along the line. The horse kept drifting. He made it open to 12 to 1. Then Sean Graham goes a bigger price, he puts a 40 in, we all follow. It's follow the leader. Sean Graham goes 16, we all go 16. Sean Graham goes 20, we all go 20. I'd have been happy at 12 to 1. Getting 20 to 1 was a bonus. So you rang the anchor man at half two and said, right, the name of the horse is Yellow Sam. On you go. So the anchor man rang their three or four friends. You know, A would ring, B would ring, C. You know, you just rang them and then they rang everybody else. They had to get out and they had to start putting fivers on that horse in every betting shop they saw. They couldn't put any more. If money starts coming for a horse, they will say, hang on, this, this could be live, and they slash the price. So you had to do it small enough to create no attention. So I headed on towards the race course, but I didn't go to the race course. I went round to a family called Brogan's. Anne Brogan was a great friend of mine. Just drove into the yard and said, look, and I'm trying to do something big. I said, I don't want to take my car. Everybody knew my car. So she drove me up to Bellustown. Jockeys, every day of the week, ride horses they never saw before. Because I'd never seen this horse in my life. You depend on your trainer to give you one or two little insights into him. And Liam was very straightforward. He said, look, if, don't be too far back, but if you're not happy with the pace, you can increase it. At that time, the race course was along the side of the road. So you could park at the side of the road and walk on over into the race course and into the centre of the track. You could get hundreds of pounds on in betting shops in towns all across Ireland. The idea was to get the money on, spread it right across the betting shops and keep the racecourse market completely free of it. If the money had got back from the off-course bootbreakers, the horse probably would have been started a six to four chance. Maximum two to one. The big one was the phone. So I got my friend Benny O'Hanlon to get into the phone box and pretend that there was an aunt of his in Drogheda Hospital, very poorly. 
he was apparently on the phone to her about a sick relative. One minute she was about to pass on and the next minute she'd okay. You know, there's something about Irish people that have that thought for people that are in trouble and dying, etc. When I went into the ring, just before the off, Liam said to me, this fellow will win. And I'm thinking in amazement, I said, he can't, he's not good enough. He win, he said. I would tell the jockey, I'd say, look, this has been working really well at home and I think you've got a great chance. I, I wouldn't say you will win because I don't know what all the other horses are doing. There was quite a lot of good riders in that race. It wasn't a gimme race, you know. The horse I was riding that day was Silver Road. I think he was the first horse I ever rode a winner on. Of course, I went there hoping that we'd win. Like every young lad who wants to be the next Leicester Piggott, and I was anything but a Leicester Piggott in style, but yeah. It was always a, an enjoyable time for me when I was in a horse I'd never ridden before. That stage where you canter down to the start. A horse will actually tell you a lot. A good moving horse on good ground, it's a lovely feeling. In the meantime, the bookies' offices knew that this bet was down. They couldn't contact the track. The phone was engaged. Everybody's going mad. The bookmakers are going mad because they're trying to ring back this, this money, but they couldn't get through because Benny's on the phone and his aunt is dying in Drogheda Hospital. If Benny had been in the phone box, some betting shop proprietor would have phoned the race course. Get me Terry Rogers, get me Billy Mulvaney. The buckets of money for this horse knocked the price. That would have been a disaster for Barney. 20 minutes in the box, the money didn't get back. This horse started at 20 to 1. With the race about to start, Barney's plans had worked out perfectly. But there was still plenty that could go wrong. The big danger would have been if somebody had been doing what we were doing. Those amateur races, they were notorious for trainers lining up a horse for them. Well, things go wrong in a race. Anything go wrong. That was a two and a half mile race, so that was probably 12 jumps he had to negotiate. A good jump is worth four occasionally. You see it every day if you watch racing enough. Good fancy horse to do four. I would choose to do it on the flat because you have no chance of falling, um, whereas you do if you're going to jump some hurdles. In those days, there was no big screens. Or you, you had binoculars and you went up to the highest point you could to watch the race. And all the bookmakers tended to gather in a cluster. I was hiding in the middle of the course. Once you're not there, they think the horse is not trying or it's not fancy. Coming into line for the second race of the car, the Montana for amateur riders and the camper. They're off. Come to the first time in the land, speed of the lead with Philippine Hill. Yellow fans just in behind them with their now. I was going as well as I expected to be going. I wasn't worried at any stage about not winning. Transland and Philippine Hill continued to share the lead ahead of Yellow Sand. The way he ran, he was up there. All he did was stay anyhow. You feel like you're giving a horse a lovely smooth ride. You're doing things right. You're on the inside or you're saving ground. Nobody's interfering with you. The others don't even notice I'm improving my position and I'm going well. I can 
remember hearing this horse coming up my outside where there was Michael Furlong absolutely pulling a roller and I'm thinking where did this thing come out of? And I tried to stay with him but I couldn't. The race was unfolding probably to my advantage. I'm the one going well, I can afford to press the button now a bit and put the squeeze on the lads who would begin to niggle behind me. Second round, yellow sound, silver road, second round. Well, I was there at the second last, watching them with my binoculars heading up towards the winning line. Because then they raced away from us, and you never know what happens. This horse was so far ahead of the rest of us. Quite happy once he jumped the last. Now is the time to win this race. But you don't win it until you get to the lollipop. But Anne Brogan, who was with me, says he's won. We were all just amazed at this other horse, Yellow Sam. Complete outsider could just turn the tables. Uh, he was a, an easy winner, in my opinion. <laughs> thinking of what the hell are the steers going to think about this because they could have very well you know at that time they could do anything they could have disqualified them or something you know that was what's uppermost in my mind when you know sam won we, we all then would walk down back to our pitches about 20 bookmakers and i remember the late billy mulvaney saying Mark my words, some bookmaker somewhere got hit with that. When we came in off the track, <laughs> you, you could sense there was something wrong. The next thing I see was two or three of the bookies coming over towards Lee and Brennan wanting an explanation. After the race, you go in, you saddle, you weigh in, you draw the correct weight, Change your clothes, shower and get out of there. Liam said to me, you just weigh in now, don't bother changing and go. I had no idea of a poop at the race that day. No idea. And it's only afterwards the story really broke out that we realised what was after going on. Which, and it was a major coup at the time. Came back to Brogan's, had a cup of tea and went home. And then I probably would have had my dinner and went to bed. There'd be no celebrations. You know, I'm not a great man to celebrate, you know what I mean? As it happened, next day, I was going to Dublin for a load of oats. On the way home, I stopped in a shop, got a paper, and on the front page, it was about this massive gamble. A picture of me and the horse jumping the last. And it was then I discovered what it was all about. Obviously, I was pleased to make the front page. <laughs> Anybody could have ridden that horse on that day, but I was very pleased to have been chosen to ride him. I thought if things went well, I could have won a hundred thousand. But I think at that time we won about three hundred thousand. So he won three hundred thousand pounds in 1975, which I think was equivalent of two million in today's money. If we had got paid, it looked to be a good, a good day's work. So then the next thing we had to collect the money. There was a friend of mine in Dublin, he says, now, Barney, you want to be very careful. There's been a lot of robberies. You're after winning a bundle. I wouldn't take the money home. So we rented a room in one of the hotels in Wicklow. 
and that's where we made our headquarters. Funny enough, I didn't think we'd have had on as much money. You see, everybody clocked in, you know. So-and-so had 40 here and 50 there. I didn't think there would be as much money on it. You know, the bookmakers were terrible. You know, they paid in single pound notes. And, you know, they were up to here. It was like monopoly money. There was 100 pound notes at the time and 50 pound notes at the time. They paid in single pound notes. It was a dodgy enough situation because we were handling a lot of money. There were people there that would cut your throat for a thousand pound, never mind for the money we had. It's become part of racing folklore. It must be the, the, the greatest scheme that's ever been staged. Yellow Sam is the name that will go down the annals of history of Bellyston Racecourse. A moderate horse, he won. Just on the day, he was ideal. He never won a race after it. I think I sold him at Doncaster Sales for 10,000 or something. Bellustown was his Grand National. We were racing him, but he told me, you know, yes, a lift to Nace today. Don't bring your own car. Okay, Barney. After racing, he said, get in there now, and we'll go into Dublin. Those amateurs are not supposed to get paid. It's a, a non-written law, you give them something. So he brought me into a garage in Dublin, and the guy gave me the keys for a car. It was a nice BMW. And what young fellow wouldn't be, like to be seen in a BMW? <laughs> well, I hope he enjoyed the car.